So what I'm suggesting, what I have seen over the years in my own spiritual process, in working with many hundreds of people on their spiritual path, both in America and in Europe, that if in fact they were born into Christianity, Judaism, even if they become shamans or, you know, Buddhist nuns, invariably over time something will come up from their deep consciousness that refers to their own mystical roots. A big challenge is if they in fact have rejected their birth religion for all kinds of reasons, very often they will turn away from what comes up for them. So, you know, they're much happier to have a Kundalini awakening and feel their chakras opening than to acknowledge that the vision of Jesus is something that they need to pay attention to. And my experience is that when people do that, they are totally thwarting their own spiritual development. They get stuck and, and nothing and nothing moves forward. And that is not to negate Buddhism or shamanism or Hinduism or Sufism or any of them. Because as I said, they all lead us to the same place. But part of being whole is to integrate and, and open to whatever comes to us in our consciousness and our process. It's not for us to choose what to accept and what to turn away from. Um, so because the more of our true identity that we integrate into our being, our worldview, our personality, the greater our spiritual development. So spiritual development then, from my perspective, is a definite psychological process. It's a reorganization of the whole self on higher levels of spiritual consciousness. Therefore, there are stages that spiritual seekers need to travel. That's also a kind of politically incorrect uh, perception in postmodern, the postmodern world. Because spiritual development suggests some people might be more spiritually evolved than others. And that's not the way we should look at things. We're all spirit, we're all equal, and everybody's the same. The person that went to a workshop and had a high and the person that for 20 years has been doing deep inner work, we're all, all the same. We shouldn't say pants. I disagree. I think there is something real about spiritual development. I think it varies according to individuals and how seriously we take it and the work we do. Um, and therefore, I see that there are stages on the spiritual path that seekers need to f acknowledge and to travel. And so while NDEs and STEs may serve as catalysts for spiritual growth, they are absolutely not enough. And they don't make a person spiritual. In my opinion, they need to be so supported by traveling a path of psycho-spiritual development in order to integrate the STEs into one's personality and way of living. Now, such work is long-term work. There are times in a person's life when we can deal with these processes ourselves. Other times, we may need a teacher or a guide. Uh, <coughs> We, we need help in facing our inner light as well as our shadow, our areas of woundedness, our, our, the places where our worldviews become conflicted. 
So the path that I'm talking about, that I've um, conceptualized into three stages, comes from my own spiritual evolution. It comes from the paths of hundreds of my clients, both in the US and Europe. It comes from me studying the great Western mystics, specifically Christian mystical literature, the Jewish Kabbalah. And as a result of all this, I see contemporary Western spiritual seekers following a path that is comprised of three major stages. And I should add, this is also adapted from Evelyn Underhill, who wrote the classic work on <coughs> Western mysticism in 1911. And so she had identified five paths that she saw the Western mystics travel. I've condensed it to three to make it um, more understandable. So I'm just going to take a few minutes now and review with you these stages. And in the Sunday workshop, we'll, we'll be able to go into it in much more depth. But the stages are <coughs> awakening, spiritual illumination, and union. And real quickly, if we talk about characteristics of awakening, it has to do with an individual getting a sudden glimpse of the transcendent by a breakthrough of consciousness. This can occur through a vision, an NDE, an STE, a big dream, a psychic or paranormal event, a synchronicity, a religious experience. That's one characteristic of awakening, and everybody in this room has gone through that, no doubt. Another characteristic of awakening is what I call asking big questions. This is, this is for the person whose life is just fine, you know? He has a good relationship, he's doing well in his career, everything's fine, and there's a gnawing inside. What does this all mean anyway? Um, psychology has called that a midlife crisis, but it's much more than that because I've seen increasingly how this is happening to young people as well. You know, what's my life about? Um, what happens at death? Is there a God? Um, so this can trigger something too. This can trigger a total reorientation. And what are the challenges that come up in awakening? Well, it can be exciting. Boy, look who I am. You know, a person can feel powerful and very enlightened. You can also feel crazy. Um, you can feel disoriented because your worldview is shaken up. Um, very often, it just brings up dying of the ego because things that you were attached to that were important suddenly don't matter anymore. Um, there's identity confusion. Um, there's confusion over your new feelings versus societies and societal views. You can feel weird or alienated from others. And you all know that. This is what the speakers are talking about. Resolution of awakening. You know, I'm just going to talk in a few words, which is silly because we could, you know, study this for a year. But very quickly, you have to accept the ambiguity of not knowing because you are not going to know. You have to be okay about remaining in confusion and slowly let your old identity and self die. But keeping in mind, and this is where a spiritual guide comes in, to remember that after ego death comes spiritual rebirth. You also have to be open to receiving spiritual guidance. You know, you have to, because sometimes it can be really hard to be clear. You have to engage in inner work in, in a very committed way. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to integrate spiritual experience into your personality and daily life. You also have to trust yourself and your process. 
in spite of opposition from others. And most importantly, you have to surrender to your experiences. So even if you're a shaman, but you have a vision of Mary or Jesus, you've got to surrender to that and open to that and follow that. Okay? So, stage two. Next one, spiritual illumination. What does this mean? Well, if you can move through awakening in a committed, serious way, you're just going to start to have some more profound spiritual experiences. They're going to be so strong that you may feel that you're living in two worlds, the physical and the spiritual. And certainly there's going to feel a conflict with that. In many ways, you're feeling totally connected to God. In many ways, you have spiritual fulfillment and joy. But there are big challenges as well. You can be overwhelmed by the experiences. You can also get to a place, OK, I've lost a lot of my ego, but I have this special relationship with you know who. <laughs> so I may not discuss it with others, but I'm certainly better than others. Right? Um, or, on the same ego level, you can feel completely unworthy. How could God speak to me, little me? Both sides of the coin are ego, because it's the I identity. In fact, it's nothing like that. You know, the goal is to ultimately become an empty vessel and just be filled with the energy and then follow it. It's not about you. But, you know, that takes a lot of work and development to get to that place. Um, now, <laughs> so there's, there's um, a method to the madness. Um, because any kind of spiritual attachment, whether it's I'm better than everybody else, or this is I'm not worthy, what typically then will happen is you will go through a period of what the mystics have documented as dark night of the soul. Well, in addition to the mystics documenting that as a really important stage, many popular authors have written books on dark night of the soul. And I think, unfortunately, what happens is I've heard from many contemporary spiritual seekers I'm in dark night of the soul now. Oh, why is that? Well, I broke up from my husband. I lost my job. This is really a dark night for me, and that means I'm going to be spiritually reborn. No, that has nothing to do with it. Dark night is of the soul is when suddenly your relationship and connection with God stops. So rather than seeing wonderful visions, you close your eyes and you see black. It's, it's like the, the deep pain of suddenly a feeling of being abandoned. There's no connection. I mean, many of our Western mystics went through years of that, where they were so desolate and there was a complete emptiness. So there's no psychological ego left, maybe. And now we don't even have a spiritual ego attachment. Well, the reason for this is because to get to the next stage, which is called union, is a place where um, union is where all the opposites and the dualities and the distinctions vanish. So boundaries disappear into oneness with God and all fellow beings. Illusion dissolves that we are separate from God. The I as a separate entity has no meaning. There's the awareness that one's essence is pure consciousness. And so spiritual union really involves the union of the whole self with the divine. And um, so therefore, ego attachment, whether it's to the material world or whether it's to a special attachment to spirit, has to dissolve. Because what union is about is 
knowing that you're just a physical empty vessel and that 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 God force and in your soul at the core has been able to fill you up because it's not being pushed away with ego and fear and other stuff and what's the point of all this the point of all this is to follow that energy wherever it takes you and to know that it, it's all one and that there's no separation. So the felt presence of God is perhaps the most awesome experience a human being can have and really leads to permanent change in the personality. Um, so the last thing I'm going to say, because time is up and we have to talk, is the third aspect, which is that a spiritual path is not to be taken casually. And I'm going to say one simple thing. I'm actually going to make, quote, I think a, a really outstanding um, spiritual teacher today named Andrew Cohen, who I really admire. And, and this, is, this is what he said. He said, something profound happens at a soul level when someone makes a commitment to their own spiritual development. And of course, when you make that commitment, you don't know what you are committing to. But what you do know is that it is a commitment to that which is absolute, to that which is non-relative, to that which means everything. Once you say yes to the absolute, to God, there is no going back, even if you want to can reconsider down the line. In other words, from the depths of your soul, an inner contract is signed. So that's what I want to say in my talk. And do we have time for a few questions or comments? Yes. Yes? Okay. Good. Let me remind you. Again, to be a service to the people who will be listening to the and watching the uh, recordings. If you have questions, please come up to the microphone today. It's well recorded. Thank you. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, I want to acknowledge you for your zest and your courage for saying it the way you believe it. <laughs> it's very refreshing in our psychological world. Um, your comment about um, going back to one's roots, I just wanted to share an experience um, because it's been quite a confusion for me. I've had three near-death experiences, and the first one, I thought all of them, but the first one, um, I had been already an Eastern meditator for 20 years, and had basically given up my Christian roots, and um, when I died, Jesus was the one next to me. Mm -hmm. And for years, 20 years, since then I got two more, and the same thing happened. Um, I asked friends of mine, and I am also a minister, I used to be a minister at the time when I was young, um, I uh, said to some of my friends, well, why do you think Jesus was there? <laughs> there really was a big confusion, a little bit still. And uh, hearing you say that gives me something to think about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's positive. It's not a negative thing. It's just interesting. Thank you. Thank you. You pointed out uh, that when you do have that ultimate experience, then you surrender to that experience in, in itself, to that experience, and then that you trust in that experience and in yourself. Question is, is there any difference between that and trusting that higher power and or God, other than the experience itself and or myself, because the self it's hopes. You're absolutely right. And if I said that, I, I didn't mean to because the union is coming together where there is no separation from the individual or from the higher power. And in the soul, it all comes together. So there really is no self or identity. It all is God, as far as I'm concerned. Trusting that even when things are really difficult, that there's a purpose and a, and a reason for it all. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, 
it, there's so much meat here that I couldn't write fast enough. And the essence of my question is, where can I go for more? Particularly when you were talking about the post postmodern definition, this uh, psycho spiritual world, um, all things including us are sacred. And mm -hmm. what came after that? And where can I find it? Is it online? Um, are notes available? Mm -hmm. There's, there's, it's being recorded. Oh, <laughs> well, but uh, but I think in in all truth, if if one really gets into the mystical literature of the different traditions throughout time, it all comes to the same thing. It all says the same thing. That this wasn't this wasn't anything unique that I thought up, and and. Not only is it in the literature, but I have seen it for 20 some years over and over again in people's processes, and it reflected my processes. So to me, that's as much bigger than the scientific method, you know, <laughs> and that's what the mystical literature is. Um, in terms of this the specific worldview that we are um, that you are suggesting, the psycho, the spiritual, I'm wondering if some main speakers at the table are missing. In other words, a lot of what I'm hearing is the perspective and just looking around is the North Atlantic thinking, which is less than the 15% of the world, and the main traditions, religions, agencies that have been addressing this for years, centuries. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering where are they? I'm wondering who or why are they not here? Mm -hmm. um, in some sense, I feel the description of this psycho-spiritual world perspective worldview, well, that's where 90% of the world has been operating on and totally dealing with. Agree. So it, it some pieces sound to me like we're discovering the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Judith. Um, my question is, we're, we're a room full of people who have had STEs or NDEs and um, from what you're saying, that there's a lot of people who, that this is only the beginning of the journey. That once that door is open, that there's a lot of work to do. And so my question is, and you said that an individual needs to find a teacher uh, to help along the way, and clearly um, one can go to Barnes and Noble and take out 100 books on, on all of this, but it's not going to uh, be enough. So. So where does one find a teacher who, as that gentleman just pointed out, uh, the world operates on one certain level, uh, and many people who have had experiences and psychologists function on one level, but you're talking about taking it to a very different level, an uncharted path. So where does one um, find a teacher at your level who's going to be able to help individuals such as ourselves. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my personal experience real quickly and many, many people that I've worked with over the years. When an individual gets to a place where you can completely trust the experience that you've had, whatever it is, whatever it is, and not start disclaiming it because it doesn't fit in to either your own worldview or what's going on around you. I believe that when you completely open and surrender to what happens and hold the discomfort that comes from that, you will be spiritually guided, whether it's by a book falling on your head that explains your experience or a guy coming into your life, or just inner understanding that comes along. It, it's, it's really a pact that you're making between yourself and spirit. 
and saying, okay, I'm going to trust, I surrender, pray, guide me, and I, I think then it will really help. Whether the, the teacher is in physical form or from an inner place. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.